Okay. So good morning and welcome to the WellMed Charitable Foundation Caregiver Teleconnection Series. Today we have a very um, difficult, highly technical topic, frontotemporal degeneration, what it is, what it isn't, and what are the signs and symptoms with Sharon Hall. And Sharon, would you please introduce yourself a little, give us some information about you and your background, and then start your presentation. Certainly. Thank you for having me. My name is Sharon Hall. I am uh, an FTD and young onset in general uh, dementia advocate. I have a husband who has frontotemporal dementia. We've completed year six after diagnosis and we're entering year seven. And I never wanted his journey to not mean anything. So I just stuck my toe in the lake of advocacy and the tsunami followed. And so I uh, happen to be quite active. I'm uh, involved in a, a, a lot of different committees and so forth nationally and locally. And I'm involved with my uh, Georgia Alzheimer's and related dementia plan groups. And so I've uh, been around the block a few times. I, I met uh, Tina at, when I presented at the NIH Research Summit on Dementia Caregiving and Services. And uh, that I've been doing this for, I, I want to say it's year five, it might be year four, four or five years uh, I've been uh, presenting this for you. So I'm uh, very happy to see so many people interested. I know FTD is a topic that a lot of people don't know anything about. And uh, so I'm always glad to inform people who don't know about FTD, about what it is, what to look for, why it's all important. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. I have some slides for you here today. Okay. All right. I don't see it yet, Sharon. No. Um... Okay. All participants, well, why aren't we sharing the screen? There we go, hold on. We're getting there. <laughs> Hang on. You're doing great. Yeah, here we go. There we go. Okay, oops. There you go. Now we can see it. <laughs> Everybody okay? Everybody sees it all right? Looks great. Okay. So frontotemporal dementia, FTD, degeneration, some people call that. Uh, on the bottom here, you'll see I am not a medical professional. I am a trained advocate and I am a care partner for someone with FTD. And this is not meant to diagnose anybody. It's for informational purposes, uh, just so you know what the signs and symptoms are, because sometimes people think of this as something different than what it really is. So uh, just to give you a little disclaimer there, I am not, uh, not the person that uh, diagnoses anything. So let's dive in, I got a lot to talk about. What is FTD? These are some of the things that, that a lot of people will say when they're talking about FTD and when they're talking about the fact that uh, what they saw. So it, it, it presents very differently than you would. Everyone thinks of dementia as Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's obviously is primarily memory based. It's usually the first thing that appears with uh, Alzheimer's, but not with FTD. And so that's why it's so difficult. And these are actual quotes from people who have been diagnosed their person has been diagnosed with FTD. And these are some of the things that they have expressed to people. Uh, they, they're not the same person they used to be. They've lost their zest for life. Well, that's kind of called apathy. And it's, uh, they can't connect the dots. They can't plan or follow. And people get very, very frustrated when they see these examples of what's happening to their person and they, are pushed into psychology. Uh, FTD people, it, it's, it's always usually starts with somebody thinking it's a psychological issue. And uh, because it presents so differently than what people normally think of as dementia. 
So uh, every time I try to explain how he doesn't care what I think or feel, I told them he's much more arrogant and self-centered. I was told it was depression and midlife crisis. Well, there's no such thing as midlife crisis. It's not in the DSM. It's not a diagnosis. Uh, so that, but that's where people put you because it's what they know. Uh, there's an automatic jump to depression and anxiety. Some of our folks feel it's the same thing. But then when they get a diagnosis or they start learning about FTD, they see how it all comes together. And this is one that we're going to talk about this craving here, uh, inability to stop eating until things are empty, staying up all hours, uh, not wanting to go outside, not wanting to be physical. How did that not trigger someone other than bipolar or depression? Bipolar is one of the things where often misdiagnosed as, as we get into the psychiatric and psychology type of uh, community there, or depression. Uh, and, and like this person says, I just knew it wasn't depression or bipolar. No one listened. And that I think is pretty common amongst just about every dementia diagnosis. Nobody listens. So here's some basic facts on FTD. It's the leading cause of dementia under the age of 60. So everyone thinks Alzheimer's is the only thing out there that, and yes, it is the most prevalent. However, under the age of 60, FTD is the most prevalent, but no one thinks about dementia under the age of 60. And people with FTD can be diagnosed from 20 to 80. So it's a pretty broad range of when you can be diagnosed. So it's not limited to people that are young onset. They can be diagnosed way into their, into their 80s, but the average age of diagnosis is usually between 45 and 60. That's kind of the sweet spot for diagnosis. And that's usually because by that time, as we all have heard recently, all of these things start many, 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 many years before anybody notices anything going on. Even with Alzheimer's, they're now finding that some of the issues in Alzheimer's are are present 20 years before. So the same is true with FTD. And oftentimes those of us who live in the FTD world will look back and say, oh, that weird thing was FTD. Mm -hmm. So uh, the average age is 45 to 60 because that's when the symptoms get to the point where you can't ignore them or you can't excuse them away. So oftentimes people that are diagnosed with FTD are diagnosed almost to middle stages. Uh, there aren't many that are diagnosed like, wow, this is the first time I've seen this and boom, they're diagnosed. That usually doesn't happen because of the difficulties. And memory loss is not a primary symptom. That is not a primary symptom for, for FTD. You can begin to have memory loss as it progresses. However, it's not the primary symptom. Usually it will present with personality change. And what we talk about there is not, you know, some people are jerks from the time they're old enough to talk and they're <laughs> that way until they die. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about personality change is the ultimate word here. So we're talking about people whose personality changes and in such ways that they either have some behavior issues, speech issues, or sometimes movement disorders. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. The average time to get a diagnosis for FTD after you say, ding, 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 something's gone off the rails, something's not right here. The average time to get to that diagnosis is four years and five providers. Wow. And that's because a primary care physician only sees zero to two people with FTD in their entire career. Neurologists only see five to 10 in their career. It is usually accurately diagnosed by a cognitive neurologist in a, or a neuropsychologist and usually in a teaching center. So a, a place that has a focus on dementia, that has a cognitive neurology clinic that focuses on 
all types of dementia, but they will know FTD and the symptoms and what, what it looks like on a neuropsych test more than a primary physician. Their primary physician is usually the person that pushes you towards a marital issue, or they uh, push you towards the, the uh, depression, or they'll say, oh, go see a psychiatrist. You know, you must have bipolar. So those are the people that will push you in that direction. And sometimes with neurologists, because they don't see a lot of FTD, they will inaccurately diagnose it as Alzheimer's. It's what they know the best. So uh, a general neurologist who might see people for for migraines and uh, essential tremors or things that neurologists normally treat, we'll have somebody come in with these symptoms and they'll go, oh, well, this must be dementia and it, it must be Alzheimer's and put them on Alzheimer's drugs. And that's not exactly the thing that should be done. FTD is just like Alzheimer's. It is a progressive and fatal neurodegenerative disease. The life expectancy on FTD in general is four to eight years, but the whole range is two to 20. So just like with Alzheimer's, if you've met one person with FTD, you have literally met one person with FTD. None of them are alike. And uh, Dr. Beauvais has, has uh, brought all these facts together and he, he's at Mayo Clinic and he's very good with FTD and does a lot of diagnosing of people who are having trouble getting diagnosis. So uh, these are the basic facts of FTD. It's more than one presentation. So it can be behavior, which is the most common. It could be language. It can be motor issues or even a combination. Because let's remember that by the time you get to the place where you are noticing something's very wrong with the person that you know or love, it's pretty progressed. And usually by then you may have a combination. So let's look at behavior variant FTD, BVFTD. BVFTD is the most common of the FTDs. FTD kind of have its own umbrella. So the first thing under the umbrella of FTD is behavior variant, and it is the most common. Uh, there can be a, a, a link through genetics for all of the FTDs, but there are also sporadic. So it's estimated now about 30, I've heard as high as 40% could be familial, but the other are sporadic. And they have found many, many, many more genes than when they first started. BVFTD used to be called Pick's disease. Some people may have heard of that before, Pick's disease. And now that's part, that's BVFTD. My husband's mother had Pick's disease. And uh, when they were diagnosed at a teaching center way back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, she was diagnosed at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, which has a dementia center. And that's where she was diagnosed. And it must have been pretty late in the in the game at that point because they called it Pick's disease, which was very uncommon. It, it wasn't something that that people saw a lot. And actually a little history here. Pick's disease was around before Alzheimer's. Albert Pick discovered Pick bodies in the brains of people that had unusual behaviors. And after autopsy found these what they're now called pick bodies. And that's where behavior variant FTD comes from is having those pick bodies in the brain. Alzheimer used PICS studies to discover Alzheimer's. So even though PICS disease or BVFTD has been around before Alzheimer's, nobody knows about it. It's all Alzheimer's all the time. So uh, that, that's kind of a little bit of history there for you. When you're looking at behavior variant FTD, these are some of the symptoms you can see. These, these symptoms are a little more excusable. You have a, a, a way of kind of excusing these. Apathy does not, apathy means that the person has completely lost their desire to do the things they've always done. So an avid golfer may say, oh, I'm not going to go golfing this week. And they used to go three times a week. So that's apathy. When you can't get them out of the chair to do anything, that's apathy. Some people look at it as depression, but, and, and the psychological community will look at that as depression. Well, they, they're depressed. 
And obviously we know people that are depressed that sleep a lot. We know people are depressed that kind of withdraw from their activities. So obviously we, we kind of say, oh, well, okay, maybe it is. Job loss is a big one with behavior variant. And the reason for the job loss is usually this next one, hypersexuality. Uh, jobs are lost because people start making very inappropriate comments to, to fellow workers. Uh, they might tell, my, my husband is like the ultimate bad joke, not bad joke, um, more like a joke you shouldn't tell in public uh, person. <laughs> and that's very, very common. They lose their filter. The front of your forehead here is your frontal lobe and behavior variance starts there. So that's where all your social graces are stored. So you kind of lose those social graces. So hypersexuality is, is a lot of times part of a jar of loss. People with BBFTD can be the most loyal husband or wife, and it's about equal, it's about 60, 40 men versus women with FTD. They could be the most loyal person. You've been married 20 years, they, you've had a wonderful marriage, and suddenly they're seeing the neighbor. And it's out of character. Keep remembering these things are out of character. Lack of empathy. These are people that always cared about their family and all of a sudden they, they don't pay any attention to them. They might stop saying, I love you to their, to their spouse. They might ignore their children and it's not common for them to do that. They also have emotional blunting and that can oftentimes be seen by those of us in the FTD community. It's kind of a blank look. It's kind of the lights are on, but nobody's home. And that's an emotional blunting. So they don't express emotion well. Uh, so uh, another big thing about BVFTD, they gain weight significantly sometimes. And it's because they overeat sweets and carbs. So somebody that might have a donut now and then suddenly is eating a dozen donuts. Somebody that might have a handful of crackers suddenly eats the entire box at a sitting. So th this overeating is a significant overeating. This isn't just, oh, gee, I got a bag of chips that I really like. I'm going to eat them all tonight because I've had such a taste for them. No, that's not what we're talking about here. We have people that will have to literally lock their refrigerators or there wouldn't be food for anybody else to eat. And uh, so they, and they will seek food as well. So oftentimes somebody can go with behavior variant, be in a restaurant. You may see somebody walk by and a person has, has uh, fries on their plate and all of a sudden their little hand goes and puts fry in their mouth. So, because they have no inhibition, they lack their inhibition. That inhibition is gone. Uh, so they have disinhibition and they'll literally take things off of people's plates. These are the ones that get people in trouble. It's estimated that about 20% of the prison population has behavior variant FTD. Wow. And this, this is why they can steal. They don't look at it as stealing. Maybe some of you saw uh, maybe over a year ago, maybe at several years ago, uh, the woman that walked out of Walmart with goods in her hands and uh, the police came and she wasn't responding to them because she was picking flowers at the side of the sidewalk and they slammed her against the, the car. This woman had dementia and they don't see anything wrong. It's not stealing. Well, the, the lines were long. I wasn't gonna wait in that line. So I just walked out. I'm not gonna wait, but they walk out with the goods. So they have been stealing. People have been stealing. It's estimated, uh, they did a study at the University of California, San Francisco, which is a leading center for FTD. It's estimated that, well, the study shows that 40% of people with behavior variant FTD have committed a crime. Not all of them have been caught. This might be, they might walk out, nobody noticed, but it still was stealing. And uh, technically they have stolen. So they have committed a crime. This one is one that no one wants to talk about, molestation. It comes from this hypersexuality. You can see people that will even 
approach their relatives, a, a sister-in-law, a cousin, uh, and, and they don't see anything wrong with that. Their, their inhibition is gone. They have disinhibition. So there are people sitting in jail that I'm sure have BVFTD and they're there for molestation. It does not excuse, I'm not saying they should be excused for their behavior, but I'm saying that they're unable to control them themselves because that filter is gone. They don't see anything wrong with it. Just as they don't see anything wrong with drunk driving. They make terrible detrimental financial decisions. This one happens frequently. Uh, they're involved in scams. If, they, if they're on the internet, if they answer their cell phone, nobody thinks anything's wrong with them. And all of a sudden they're sending money to a foreign country because they think that uh, someone is in love with them. So this is a very difficult thing for people that are trying to get a diagnosis and the person maybe has spent their whole 401k on, on a Lamborghini and came home and they have five children and the wife is going, what did you do with our van? So and they've cashed in their whole 401k because, well, I wanted it. I've always wanted one. And that, those are the kinds of things that happen and they're very uncharacteristic. Aggression, you see this guy over here? It can turn to aggression because they can't control it. My husband will get aggression, not towards me. Some people have it towards the person that they live with, but he is very impatient. And, and if he feels he's being taken advantage of in public, he will lose his temper like that. And I can't stop it. I'm not going to keep him at home. So I just turn around and say, I'm sorry, he has dementia. And I always have some brochures with me and pass them out. So they know what FTD is. We've had some pretty interesting uh, experiences out in public. But if people don't understand that this is a brain disease, his brain is dying. And I'm sorry if it's dying in the place where the social graces are. I can't help that. If those, if those neurons are gone, I can't help it. So we don't hide, we go out. And if people don't understand, I'm sorry. Uh, prostitution. Some people, some men who would never think of, of going to a prostitute, you'll find them arrested because they've solicited prostitution. Some of the women that have FTD engage in prostitution because of this hypersexuality. Gambling is another thing that happens frequently. Uh, they will start gambling when they've never done that before. So these are all things that didn't happen before. I always say when someone, and I you're gonna hear this many times today, when someone is not who they were, think neurology, eliminate neurology before going the psychiatric or psychology route. So it's very important for you to keep notes. If you notice these little things happening, like, you know, my husband was, was such a great guy. And now he, he doesn't even talk to the neighbors. He sits and watches TV all day. And, you know, his job is getting mad at him. I think he's going to lose his job. Write it down. These are important facts for the person that will ultimately diagnose FTD because it has to come from the family. Because the other thing about, be, especially behavior variant FDD, is they have what is called a nosognosia, which means they have no knowledge that anything is wrong with them at all. It's all somebody else's fault. So a job loss, they'll come home and say, oh, I lost my job, but you know, my supervisor has been against me for years. No idea why they lost their job. It wasn't because they weren't doing it for them, it was because somebody else caused it. So uh, those are the things that, that get people into trouble. And BVFTD, in my opinion, maybe that's because I deal with it every day, is probably one of the hardest things to deal with because of this lack of social uh, graces. Your social graces go right out the window. And you know these are the people that in a grocery store will say, oh my gosh, look at that ugly dress that woman has on. Just like a child would do, but they're an adult and people don't expect an adult to do that. They expect an adult to have more 
inhibition to keep that social grace, but they do not because it has died in their brain. The next form of uh, FTD is primary progressive aphasia or PPA. There are actually three variants of PPA, but the ones that fall under the FTD umbrella have now been reduced to two because they found that the logopenic is more geared towards Alzheimer's, although they can have FTD as well. So we're just going to talk about non-fluent agrammatic, all these big words that, that are used. And what this means is that you're just losing your words. You know the meaning of the word. You know what you want to say. And these people might explain it to you. Hand me that thing that you, that you eat soup with. That's losing the word. They know what it does. They know the meaning of a spoon, but that word spoon just won't come out of their mouth. They're looking, looking, looking. Um, 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 um. These are your ummers. Um, um, um. Now you go start with behavior variant and then primary progressive aphasia is your temporal lobe. So frontotemporal dementia, your forehead, above your ears, those are the two places we're talking about. And above your ears, that's your language. So this non-fluent agrammatic, you retain the meaning, but the word finding is gone. You can't find the word. You know what you're talking about. You know what you're looking for. You know what you want. You just can't find that word. Consequently, they're very unable to follow spoken direction because they lose their ability to understand as well. So language becomes confusing to them and, and they don't understand. The other day I was explaining something to my husband about something that I had ordered and that it wasn't going to be coming in when they said it was, and it, I wanted it date sensitive and it wasn't going to be coming. And I was explaining that to him and he looked right at me and said, I don't understand anything you just said. So he heard me. Oftentimes people will think that this is hearing loss. It's not hearing loss, it's comprehension loss. My husband, because he has BVFTD, he has moved into the PPA now as it progresses. Because as neurons die in one place, they find another place to, to go away from. So his is kind of moved now and he's having problems with his language. He's always, he's worn hearing aids for, Oh, 20 years. And, uh, and so we were thinking that he needed, you know, we, we've gotten new hearing aids over the years. You don't have them for 20 years, you know, something new always comes out. So he's gotten them several times. And we've been going to the same audiologist when we moved here to Georgia. We've been going to her for 17 years. Rod is diagnosed six years ago. When we went in after his diagnosis and had his test, she said, if I didn't know he had FTD, I would send you to a neurologist. He's hearing everything I say, he's not comprehending it. So in the beginning, his comprehension was around 75%. It's now down to about 30% on his latest hearing test. So if someone all of a sudden seems hard of hearing that wasn't hard of hearing, it could be they're not understanding what you're saying. So uh, that's one of the, the key things that, that you need to look for as a different, when someone is not who they were, think neurology before psychology. So they're not ignoring you, they may just be having that, that lack of understanding. They also can have apathy and lose their job because obviously if they're not understanding directions from their boss, it can be very difficult for them. There's a semantic variant as well. This is where they lose the meaning of the word. So you might put a bowl of soup in front of them, hand them a spoon, and they'll say, what do I do with this? What is this? That they've lost the meaning of the word. There's no meaning attached to that word. So these are the people that just don't know what something is to be used for. They also have apathy and a lot of anxiety because they, everything looks like, what is that? I don't know what that is. They'll misname objects. So they may say, if a bowl of soup is put in front of them, they may say, well, could you give me a shovel? Well, it looks the same. 
I scoop things up with it, right? But it's not what you eat soup with, unless you have pretty long arms. Maybe then you could. But, but for the most part, you're not going to eat with a shovel. So that these are the people that misname objects. So this is a quote from someone. He was losing his ability to use language. He had a traumatic brain injury and symptoms could be attributed to that except the loss of language. Mm -hmm. It was referred to a psychiatrist believing it was a psychosis. And then when they look back, I'm like, why wasn't he referred to a neurologist that specialized in TBI? That was what I alone hunted down and where the actual correct diagnosis came from. Wow. So always remember when someone is not who they were. We've talked about behavior with the behavior variant. Now we're talking about language. So if they're not the same person in behavior or language, get to a neurologist, even if, get to a teaching hospital is your best bet. But if you're too far away, usually a neuropsychologist will be much better at pinpointing uh, FTD than even a regular neurologist because in their neuropsych testing, they will find executive dysfunction. They will find the apathy. They might even see the emotional blunting uh, in, the, in the process of their neuropsych testing because neuropsych testing usually takes three, five hours, something like that. Some people are over in an hour. They get up and say, I'm done. Very indicative of people with FDD. They're very impatient. So, um, and the, if you go to a neuropsychologist, and they don't speak to the family about why they're there, they're not going to be a good person to diagnose because the family is who knows what's going on. They must listen to the family. Any physician you go to, if they're not listening to you as a family saying, this isn't the person I married, this is not my father, he never did this before, run, run. The next one is corticobasal degeneration. This is more of the motor skills that we taught. We said that behavior, language, now we're into motor skills. So uh, corticobasal is under the FTD umbrella. These people might stumble a lot. They have poor coordination. And a lot of times it only affects one side of their body first. So if somebody is right-handed and suddenly you see them eating dinner with their left hand, they're not using their right hand as much. Maybe they stumble, they seem like they're uncoordinated and they say, oh, I'm just getting older. I wasn't paying attention. Ding, ding, ding. Especially if it's one side of the body. They can have uh, the, um, the limb when, when, the, when they don't recognize their own hand. Like, what is that? so that they can have that type of disorder. They can also have the speech issues, also can lose their jobs. Another thing about all of these things with FTD, oftentimes people have very high jobs. They're very accomplished, oftentimes very mathematical for some reason. We have an overabundance of engineers that have been diagnosed with FTD, but we have physicians we have uh, people in NASA, uh, all walks of life. We also have people who are uh, long haul truckers. It does, there's no, there's nothing about FTD that you can say this is the population. You know, sometimes with Alzheimer's, we could say the population is usually over 65, oftentimes a woman. That's kind of common, not with FTD. That's not the way it goes. So, uh, but job loss usually takes a while because the people are very accomplished. And, and so people make excuses for them or they cover for them. And, and so the job loss may take a while, unless of course it's the hypersexuality and they're stalking a fellow coworker that becomes pretty obvious pretty quickly. They also can have apathy and aggression and the emotional blunting. So you can see how all of these sort of share some of the symptoms. That's why they're all under this FTD umbrella because they do share some symptoms. But what presents first 
is where they go with what it is. And a lot of times, many people with FTD, they'll, they'll have brain donation because the family will want to know, you know, for, for research purposes and to, to further, you know, the, the people researching FTD, brain donation is very, uh, very big in FTD. We all want our person to have meant something. And if it means moving forward with research, that's a good thing. So uh, oftentimes we have brain donation and it can be a huge surprise. You can, uh, a person can be diagnosed with Alzheimer's and on di upon diagnosis, they thought they always had Alzheimer's, they pass away, they do the brain donation, the, the autopsy comes back and says they had FTD. They did a study in England and uh, they took, what they did is that was people that donated their brains. These are people who had passed away. They were clinically diagnosed with a dementia. And of course, when they're looking at the brain, they're looking at exactly what's going on. And they know exactly what happened in the brain when they're looking at the brain after death. So they separated the two. They did not look at the clinical information. They, they didn't pay any attention to what this person with the brain in front of them had. They were just finding what was wrong. They then went back and looked at what they were diagnosed with. And for people under the age of 65, two out of three were actually FTD and not oh Alzheimer's. Wow. Well, so misdiagnosis in FTD is huge misdiagnosis is, is just enormous. And the ones that not only is it misdiagnosed, it's underdiagnosed. Just as I said, 20% of the prison population can have FTD unbeknownst. They pass away. They're, they're on schizophrenic drugs or on bipolar drugs. Or it, it, it's just, it's a mess. It's a mess. FTD is very difficult. Very, very difficult. That's why it's important to learn about this because every time I talk to a group, there will be somebody that goes, I think my uncle has this, or I think my cousin has this, or my brother-in-law. Ah, many are divorced prior to diagnosis because who's going to live with somebody that's, that's uh, exhibiting disinhibition and, and uh, making, uh, propositioning the neighbor. Uh, who's going to live with that? And who thinks of dementia when they're 40 years old? Right. So Sharon, Sharon, I don't want to interrupt you, but we have about 20 minutes left. And yeah. I know you have a I, I'm almost at the end. <laughs> okay. So here's progressive supranuclear palsy. This is very much like cortical basal. They have tremors. The big one here is the eye movement disorder. They they don't move their hand, eyes up and down and side to side well. And these are the people that have the outbursts of crying and laughing unexpectedly. And they have a tendency to fall backwards and they're oftentimes diagnosed with Parkinson's, but what they actually have is Parkinsonism. So you see a lot of the same things here, the aggression, they very oftentimes progressive supranuclear palsy people look like behavior variant people. Then there's the infamous BVFTD ALS. One third of people with ALS will have behavior variant FTD. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? The BVFTD came first, it's BVFTD ALS. They were diagnosed with ALS first and now they're having all of these symptoms of BVFTD, it's ALS BVD, B, BVFTD. So uh, they share a gene, they share the C9ORF72 gene. So oftentimes it's in the family, sometimes not, can be sporadic, but they are closely aligned with each other. And quickly going to go through this. You're going to see that the statistics here, there's 3.9 million young onset dementia of all types in the world. A third of them have children under 18. A third of them have no health insurance. The costs are double for young onset dementia, $120,000 versus $60,000 for Alzheimer's per year. They lose their jobs at the prime of their life. So uh, they lose their... They have to go on social security disability 
they do not get Medicare for two years, it can be a real disaster. They have, a third of them have no health insurance as well. This is my contact information and I'll kind of leave this up here as we go through questions. So questions. Wow, that's all I have to say. What a lot of information. I'm sorry to speed you up like that. You were oh, no, really no, close not, to not at all. <laughs> Those last ones uh, pretty much mimic the others. Uh, that's okay. why they're all under the same umbrella. So a okay. big one is BVFTD to explain. Well, our first chat question is, are we able to get a copy of the slides? Oh, absolutely. I'll, I've sent them to you. So you can, you're okay. perfectly welcome to, uh, you're welcome to share. Okay, thank you very much. Now folks, just you can, if you're on the phone, you can unmute your phone and I will see who's been unmuted. Um, Becca Pound, you have something you'd like to say to us? Hey, I'm sorry if I missed this, but I'm curious if this can be related to Parkinson's or Parkinsonism. Some people with FTD can exhibit Parkinsonism. It's not a primary, it's not the first thing that exhibits. Sometimes with progressive supranuclear palsy, it is what people are diagnosed with is Parkinson's because they fall. And, but the key thing with progressive supranuclear palsy is the eye movement. And when you go to a cognitive neurologist, they'll, they'll say, look left, look right, look up, look down. They have a hard time doing that. That's eye, their eye movements are disordered. So uh, it's, but with FTD, it's Parkinsonism. Usually they don't have both. The people that have two different types with Parkinson's is usually Lewy body. Thank you. That's great. Okay, let's see, Bev Curry. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I don't know. We can hear you. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, my husband just passed away a month ago from FTD. Um, he had the behavioral variant and also um, the uh, primary progressive aphasia. But do you think, or do you agree that usually they die of um, pneumonia or have you noticed there's other yes. causes? That pneumonia is the primary cause. And uh, that's because movement eventually becomes an issue as well. Uh, your husband may have been bedridden. Not everyone is bedridden with, with FTD before they pass away. People can be walking and talking the day before they die with FTD. Uh, but for the most part, it will progress as it progresses. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, yeah, it's uh, pneumonia is number one of, or and UTI is number two, septic, being septic. So it's usually an infection that will take out someone with FTD. And Sharon, if I'm right, aspiration pneumonia is, yes. is a major cause for Alzheimer's, right? Well, more so with ALS and FTD, they lose that ability of swallowing. Mm. So my, my husband does that. In fact, last night I, he was, I was on my support group meeting and I said, I hear Rod coughing and it was pretty late. So we stopped and sure enough, he had been in bed and started choking oh. and, uh, and was coughing. He has been in the hospital with aspiration pneumonia. No cough. He didn't have a cough when he had oh. aspiration pneumonia. Oh my goodness. We had another question uh, about getting the slides by email. Again, if you are registered for this session, we will be sending out a post-session questionnaire. Um, by email, want you to fill it out because we get information from you on how we can do a better job and how you liked the presentation and what could have been different. And it helps us improve all the time, but you'll only get that if you're registered. So in the very beginning, um, Minerva put on the chat room, the phone number to register if you're not registered. And I will give you that phone number right now, again, in case you didn't get it. It's 866-390-6491. And that's our WellMed Charitable Foundation customer service. 866-390-6491. Must be registered to be able to get all of these resources. And also, 
you're going to hit it big because you're going to get the monthly calendar. And I don't have it yet. Usually I tell people about what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. I don't have the calendar for June yet, but we're really lucky at least on Thursday of next week, or no, this Thursday, the 26th, we have Jamie Heisman, who's always a very popular speaker. And he's going to talk to us about within us all our superpowers that we underestimate but can get us through many challenges. So he always is a really fun person to listen to. So other questions, other, you know, other comments. Um, and I, I just do a say- podcast and I have about six years worth of archive podcast here at Podbean. And uh, that, that link will be sent to you as well. That talking FTD for you.podbean.com will, uh, will be in the information on the slides. So and Thank I do you. a bi-weekly FTD care chat. And uh, that will I will send that to Evelyn. And if you are affected by FTD and need a support group, can't do this alone. Uh, the, the one thing that we tell people, number one, go to an elder law attorney, get your affairs in order. Uh, that's number one, because you want to get a handle on the money. They can spend money like water. They have no concept. My husband, we're, he's going to have a birthday. And it's always around Labor Day. And so we don't usually do anything. And we went to my daughter-in-law's birthday. And so it brought it up for him. Nobody's doing anything for my birthday because they're very self-centered. And uh, so I said, oh, well, let's do it the following weekend. Before I knew it, he was inviting 50 people, wanted wanted me to feed them wings from a wing place here and barbecue. And he told the people at his day center, he goes to day center three days a week. uh, He told them that it was from noon to midnight. So we had to rein it in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bev, I just I wanted to say to you, Bev, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, yes, and I thank you for thank sharing. You. Always we know, so thank we you. know where you've been. All of us, yeah. I, I, uh, Ellen will know this, but uh, in I always have called the people in the FTD community redwoods, and there the reason for that is that a redwood tree is extremely tall. It's one of the tallest trees are, there is, but they have very tiny roots. And the only way that they stand up is they intertwine their roots with each other. And to me, that represents the FTD community. We are entwined with each other. No one else understands what we go through every single day unless we've been there. And so I always call us the Redwoods. So it's uh, in the chat. Sometimes we'll talk about the Redwoods. And that, wow. that's where that comes from, is that you have to have entwined roots when you have FTD in your home. We also that's have sure. a comment from Arlena. Please go ahead. I, yes, ma'am. I have a question. Does a head trauma, can a head trauma cause the FTD? It can't cause FTD. FTD is a neurodegeneration. So a, a traumatic brain injury is just that. It, it, it's an injury. So it doesn't progress. Uh, the thing about FTD is it is progressive. So uh, you, you hear a lot about football players and the CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, very closely related to PVFTD and its symptoms. Uh, but the thing about FTD is it is a neurodegenerative disease. So uh, that, that makes it different. You're not going to, um, you're not going to die from a traumatic brain injury unless it's so severe, it's going to obviously do away with you immediately. But a traumatic brain injury in and of itself is not progressive. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's see. I had something here from uh, Pat Way to everyone. About a year ago, my husband began making noises. He can answer questions at times with one or two um, words. The noises get louder and more continuous in the evening. Would this come under PPA? He has been diagnosed with dementia and now after four years, or is being sent to an FTD doctor? Yes. Um, obviously, when you have PPA and you're losing language, 
you are still going to vocalize, you know, so uh, a lot of times people with PPA will make sounds. It's not that they can't make sound. It's not a sound production thing. It, it's an inability to form the words or get the words out or find the words or lose the meaning of words in the semantic variant. So it's all about, uh, about the words. It, it, it's not about inability to produce speech. Although oftentimes people with FTD who progress to the language will become mute. More questions, more comments for our expert here. Okay, Hilaria. Yes. Um, can someone that possibly me getting FTD uh, that still occasionally drives, well, how? What, at what point do you tell them you can't drive? Upon diagnosis. And let me tell you why. They seem to be quite normal. Uh, people with FTD can fake it till they make it. Uh, if my husband today, he's mid-stage, if he goes out and says to someone, I have dementia, they laugh. But let me tell you, if they drive, and they get in an accident, even if it is not their fault, and I can tell you many instances of this happening, they are sued because they have a dementia diagnosis and you can lose everything. So it's a very difficult thing to do to take away the keys. It can cause great stress, but you have to enter their world and you have to find a way to get those keys away. You can disable the car, you can uh, say that a relative needs a car. We're going to loan it to him for a while and then never bring it back. Uh, there are many ways that you can get around it. Some states, you can report them yourself anonymously to the Department of uh, Motor Vehicles. You can do that here in Georgia. You can say they shouldn't be driving. They get a letter saying, have a doctor fill this out within 30 days or you lose your license. The doctor will never sign his name that the person can drive once they've been diagnosed with any dementia, it's an extremely dangerous thing to do. And I know it's hard to do. It's probably one of the hardest things to do if, if the person is not willing, but it absolutely must be done. You are jeopardizing the public because they can run over people and go, yeah, so they got in my way. So Be Becca wants to know, Becca Pound would like to know a little bit more about how how they could be sued because the, the person that uh the person that they run into or the person that runs into them their attorney uh, and their insurance company and their attorneys are going to go we want to see your medical records and if they can pinpoint it on something and when it's dementia they will pinpoint it and say they shouldn't have been driving well, he hasn't been diagnosed with any of this. I just want, since I'm his caregiver, I want to look out for all the symptoms that you can provide that I can kind of keep an eye on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it's, it's hard to take away driving. A lot of people will let their person drive locally. Well, they're fine. They're fine until they're not. And the one time they're not, how would you feel if they ran over a child who ran out in the street for a ball because Bye. they were on their way to the store, the kids shouldn't have run out. Yeah. I know in California, um, you know, we always counsel people to talk to the doctor because the doctor can write a note to the DMV and have the license pulled. It's still another issue to hide those keys, to hide that car you know, to, to get it away from somebody because it takes their independence away. It it's, does. It, yeah. so it, it does. I mean, it, it's a difficult, difficult thing. I understand it totally. I understand the, especially people with a nosognosia that don't know they have, there's anything wrong with them. It's you, not them. And they're going to fight you tooth and nail, but it is so important because the one time that they mess up, it could be very disastrous it's tragic, right of course uh yeah because usually you know even though i don't i don't see any any big uh issues right now i just want to keep this in the back of my mind 
watch him. You know, usually when he drives, I'm always with him. You know, I don't like for him to go alone anywhere. Uh, sometimes, you know, how they'll say, well, I'm just going to the corner to the pharmacy to pick up something, you know, and he feels good that he can go to the pharmacy and come back home, you know, but sometimes I, sometimes I'll just make an excuse. Well, let me go with you because I need to look for some other stuff that I need to just Smart. because I'm, I want to keep watching how he's handling himself when he drives because he's always been a fantastic driver, really good driver. But, you know, as we, as he progresses with his illnesses, I need to kind of keep an eye out for that stuff. Absolutely. And you can always say, how about if I go with you and, and I'll just drive and then you can just run in and I'll wait in the car for you. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about parking and I'll just drop you off and you come right back out and I'll, I'll just drive you up there. Yeah. Good idea. <laughs> you have to be creative when dementia is in your world. You have to live in their world. You, they cannot live in yours. Never argue. It's wasting your breath. I always say, expect nothing and praise everything. So yeah. don't expect them to do what they've done before. And if they yeah. do it, praise them up one side and down the other. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Sharon, do you want to, set, do you want to share a little bit about your online uh, support group? Yes, I, I do an online support group on Mondays and Saturdays at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it's called FTD Care Chat. And I will send that link to Evelyn. It will remain the same all the time. I never change it. You got enough to worry about taking care of someone with FTD. You don't have to worry about searching for a link every week. So, so it, uh, I do it Mondays and Saturdays, 7 p.m. And we have people from all over the country. Wow. Like to know. Okay. And Ellen, we, have, we have time for one more comment or question. Who wants to be the last and the best? All right, then I'm going to take a minute just to thank you so much, Sharon. I have learned so much. And this, this information, these slides are gold. Thank you. And we, will, we will make sure that we get them to everyone who's been online today. Also, folks, you, you will soon be getting the teleconnection calendar for June. Please sign up for all the ones that you're interested in. Please go and look at the podcasts on www.caregivertelleconnection.org because there probably is at least one and maybe 10 that relate to some of the things that you're thinking about or some of the issues you may be having and they can really help you. And, and before that, you go, before okay. you go, when someone is not who they were, think neurology, not psychology. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll include that quote. <laughs> In, in our in our handout okay <laughs> Sharon thank you you've done a beautiful job I want to thank all of the caregivers on the line today for what you do caregiving is not an easy job and sometimes it can be a thankless job so I would like to thank you very much and with that thank you for having me thank you for yes. attending I hope you learned something <laughs> thank you and I will now um, stop the recording you'll hear a little announcement.